and she has an MFA in printmaking. So I'm really excited for her to tell you a little bit about that process. And she has kind of a mixed media, um, leads with lots of different processes, collage and, and screen printing and things in her work, which is um, uh, unusual and, and fun to talk about. And her work has a lot of different themes that I hope that um, we all can maybe connect to some on, on lots of levels. All right, so these are some of the, you can see here, she's um, exhibiting in our Zoe Galloway uh, gallery, which is in um, on the first floor here. And you can see some of her works uh, on display. It's really quite beautiful and interesting and really make you wanna learn more directly from the artist. So I'm really excited that she is here to share with us. And you'll get to see these more up close in her presentation as well. So I just wanted to give you guys a little sneak peek to the gallery. Um, and let me end screen sharing. All right, I'm gonna let um, Libby take it away. Okay. Um, and now I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, those images looked good. Thank you so very much, Angie. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Um, I know that everyone's schedule is busy and so taking some time out of a Friday afternoon, I, I certainly appreciate that. I'd like to thank Anissa and Angie both for making um, the talk today possible and then also the exhibit. When I drove down a few weeks ago, um, to deliver the work. I was so impressed with the space, not only kind of the preservation effort to have such a beautifully kept space, but also um, it, it's just a really nice place for, for the town to have to, to feature some diverse work. And so I'm so very glad to be part of the 2020 exhibition schedule. So um, thank you all again. Um, in preparing for today, I had indicated to Angie that I would give a little bit of a gal, um, excuse me, a studio tour. <laughs> what I didn't really think about was the fact that our walls are three quarter in, in the, um, the studio building, which means I have to wear a mask the entire time and sound travels. And when half of the building is filled with 20, 21 year olds, it can get pretty loud because <laughs> I am a, a college professor. Um, at Columbus State University, which is in Southwest Georgia. So what I did instead is that I decided to make just a quick video. It's about five or six minutes. Um, so bear with me. I'm just gonna kind of take you through my space so that you can see how I work, where I work, and maybe kind of how I fragment my space in order to facilitate the way that I make work. Um, and then also I was wearing a mask, so there are some sighs and like <laughs> catch my breath a couple of times. So um, hopefully all of you all can I identify with that um, and can forgive me as such. So anyway, so I'm going to just go ahead and click on this video and then we'll pick back up and talk about the, the work that's in the exhibit. So this is my personal studio, which again is located um, on the bank of the Chattahoochee River in Columbus, Georgia. I use two spaces when producing my work. One is the printmaking facility located within the Corn Center um, Visual Arts Building, our studio building, and the other is here in the depot. On the wall, you'll see works that are currently in progress. They are a combination of drawing, prints, collage, all of the prints that I actually pull are, are pulled next door using a press with a variety of means, either uh, litho, possibly relief. You'll also see some monoprint techniques. Um, the next wall in my studio is basically remnants of those prints. So as I produce work, I do apply them to something which is called Duramount, which allows any kind of print or piece of paper to become a double-sided sticker. It is an archival process. And let me show you over here what that looks like. So after I pull a print, I will keep these kind of stacked up, sometimes for years, sometimes for months. You can see a variety of prints here. I also have storage. 
And then once I decide to use a print in a current piece, I go through the process of applying that Dura mount, which you can see close up here, which again is a double-sided archival adhesive. I have to apply a great deal of pressure to ensure that those do not come off later on. And then I go through a process of, of cutting. So I do work intuitively, and I know we'll talk about that in the in a little bit during the artist talk, but I wanted to give you an overview of kind of how my studio setup functions and how it enables me to work intuitively in creating these collage pieces. Um, over here on the side of the wall, I have two pieces that have recently been completed. Again, those are also um, combination mixed media pieces of collage, drawing, and print. All of those were completed here. Um, the background is, is usually where I begin, and those are usually some type of pressure print to offer kind of a tonal background that I respond to. And then you can see some of the things like um, this noose, the rope, some of the decorative elements. Those are all parts of prints that have been cut down after they were applied to the Jura mount to offer that double stick adhesive. And then I work over a period of sometimes weeks, months, um, just depending on what my schedule is and how the work is developing. In some of these darker areas, and you'll notice this within the exhibit as well, this is actually me going back in, oftentimes with graphite, sometimes with charcoal, and sometimes with colored pencils, and working back in to the piece. I do that sometimes uh, for formal reasons, sometimes to add depth, uh, sometimes um, it also enforces maybe the concepts or ideas that I have within the piece. And you can see that I, I work back and forth the drawing does not always come last. And in fact, very often, it will come second. So in this piece, I would have completed the background print, added some graphite where I wanted areas to get darker, and then continued to cut and collage from the stack of prints that I showed you a moment ago. I do have a small press in my studio. Oftentimes, it isn't large enough for the, the pieces that I'm working on, such as the ones that are in the exhibit, but it does allow for me to do some small pulls and um, either small pieces or small areas that I will ink up here in the studio, print and pull if I feel like I need something pretty immediately and I don't want to, to go to the larger lab facility and pull a large edition. I usually will pull just a couple of one ofs, maybe two ofs, and that will be it. And then the rest of the time I'm really working in this area. One, um, one kind of area I've set up as an impromptu designated it as my cutting station, right? I also am a little bit messy, as you can tell. I like to, I'm one of those people that like to have everything out in front of me as I'm working so that I can find the colors I'm looking for, the shapes, the decorative elements, et cetera. And um, I will use this area over here, not only just to kind of spread out the pieces before I start cutting them down, but also if I need um, to apply pressure as I'm going through the process, I like to apply intermittent um, times. I like to go in and apply pressure rather than just waiting at the very end. Um, also, you can see I have a great view. This is um, the breezeway between the main art facility studio building here on campus and then the row of faculty studios, which I'm in now. And then over here, I have my drafting table, which is where I do a great deal of just my drawing and planning. Uh, so that pretty much takes us around the studio. And um, I wanted to offer this as kind of an overview of what my space looks like. So as we start talking about the pieces, um, you have an idea of, of what it looks like. And 
and where I am working. So, thank you very much. Um, okay, so that probably was a little bit more painful for me to watch rather than um, <laughs> hopefully you all. Let me see, I clicked on the wrong button. So this is my personal ah! studio, which again, my apologies. <laughs> you wouldn't know that I had practiced this prior to, to logging on. Um, but so hopefully what you were able to see through the kind of small studio tour was that I, I do not only collage and pull from a variety of different materials, but I also am kind of very fragmented and keep the, the way in which I work separate. And so I think that that's something as an idea that you'll, you'll see kind of reappear when we talk about work. So before we jump into the body of work that is currently on view um, at the Gatson Art Center, I wanted to kind of back up just real quickly, just point out a couple of pieces that um, were, were from previous bodies of work. And so um, I'm not gonna show you all the work that I've been making since the mid 90s. I'm just gonna kind of hit some highlights, pieces that I think directly um, the ideas are reflected in current works. And also I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about some printmaking techniques. And um, one technique that you'll see repeatedly show up in my work are lithographs or lithography. And those are grease drawings that are completed on um, Bavarian limestone. And I was very fortunate when <laughs> I got the position at CSU that we do have a, a very nice selection of stones and I was able to get into lithography again because during my time of graduate school to CSU, I was without a printmaking facility and I was drawing a lot by hand. So something that I wanted to point out in these pieces is, is kind of this, this dark, rich nature in the drawings and the, and the range of value and contrast that I'm really interested in, not only for the physical depth that can be created, but also because I think that it, it can be representational of um, ideas of either, well, obviously darkness, but also sadness. There's also um, just this real kind of rich void that can be present within those dark values. And that's something that I think shows up even in the current body of work. Something else with the Kohlmeyer series that I was working on um, towards the tail end of that grouping of work was um, really thinking about the conceptual relationship of a figure ground relationship. And so what I mean by that is how the negative space and the positive forms relate and interlock with one another. And what ideas could possibly come across to a viewer through a process of extraction, right? So removing information. So whereas in the last piece that you saw, it was more of a fully rendered image, this, the image almost begins to disappear in the bottom half or so of the drawing, simply because I allowed the white of what is the paper or the, the tone of the paper to kind of finish out the image itself. And at this time, I also started to have more liberty with the way that I was approaching form and figure and being less concerned with having accurate representation because what I found I was most interested in and in kind of conveying these men and these drawings were kind of the story of their eyes or the stories that weren't necessarily there. Um, and, and so in addition to that, um, another grouping of work from the past, um, which was made uh, in a, at the same time, as I had mentioned that I had done a lot of drawing in, in between um, graduate school and moving to Columbus. So um, by nature, um, I'm a very graphic drawer. I, I generally will flatten things. I know that sounds a little bit different than what I just showed you with the coal mining um, pieces because those do have a nice range of depth and form. But you can see by looking at some of the pieces currently on view in the exhibit, I do have a real interest in kind of flattening space and what that can mean to the viewer, what that can contribute to the work. And so some pieces that I feel really begin to, to start talking about that more successfully and also begin to uh, represent some of the collage aspects and, and, and ideas of kind of duality are in um, pieces that I created for this installation. And these images, are hand-drawn pen and ink. 
um, the, the body, the, the short series of works that I did were really representations of hand-painted signs within a drivable distance of a place where I had lived. And all of them were <laughs> a, a bit awkward in some way. And so this is on a rural um, state highway from Columbus, Georgia to Birmingham, Alabama. And as you take a curve, a turn in the road, you're only able to see one side at a time. And while I believe it was um, the maker's intent for it to read Good News Baptist Church, I thought it kind of funny and ironic that one side, all you could see is Good Baptist and the other was News Church. <laughs> and, um, and thinking about kind of the people that, um, that make up a community, there are often um, very diverse groups of people. Um, oftentimes those lines, especially in rural settings into towns can be drawn um, uh, simply by um, the, the economics of, of that area and that, in that place. And so I was very interested in kind of representing the, the determination in the mark of the hand in juxtaposition to the, the damask wallpaper in the background. And so um, again, this is all one larger drawing, uh, pen and ink that was then cut and adhered to um, that wallpaper. And another one I'll show you just because um, <laughs> it used to be one of my favorite drawings, but um, this yellow sign that was hand painted that says, trust Jesus. And you can barely see the G behind the J because whoever drew this um, originally <laughs> said Jesus with a G. And I always thought that was quite funny. Um, but what, what was interesting here again to me um, was this idea of while I was working on creating what is a, a very you know, rendered drawing, it's flattened and it's highly stylized. Um, it does feel very different in contrast to what the perceived maybe idea of um, where we would normally see the place setting for this um, wallpaper. And so while I did continue to make a lot of work between 2008, 2009, which is what I'm showing you, you know, in the last few slides, and then we're about to pick up um, a little bit later. So additional work was made and I do invite you to go to my website. I just, I want to be, you know, respectful of everyone's time today. In the meantime, and um, Angie already, you know, hit it upon this uh, in the introduction, it was that I am a parent, I am a mother. And so um, December of 2010 is when uh, we welcomed our son into our life, our oldest child. And then our youngest was born in March of 2014. And I really love this picture. <laughs> I, I, I love it because I, I feel as if it is a visual representation of the, <laughs> the kind of the inner, um, you know, mind of myself for several years, you know, somebody was always needing attention. Someone always was, um, you know, it's just, it was fun, you know, having little kids is fun, but it also can be a distraction. It also can um, really take you out of the studio, which is something that is important in my work currently. And in the last several years has been kind of reclaiming my voice as an artist, um, through examination of the role of family. And so as I move into the current body of work that is um, on Hugh and Gatston, um, I do want to pick up on an important point as well as just the birth of, of the kids was uh, a trip that our family took in 2015. Um, my husband is a sculptor. He also is a professor at CSU and he was awarded um, a very prestigious Fulbright Core Fellowship. He was the first visual artist to receive that um, award to study in this uh, country of Sweden. And so why that's important to my current body of work is that we packed up the family and we left for almost seven months. And my husband said, you know, Liv, you should maybe take some stuff in case if you have time to make some work. <laughs> and that just seemed like a very um, obvious point that I should have considered without him mentioning it, but I didn't. 
And I knew whatever I had to take had to fit in a suitcase and we were um, limited on space of what we could take. And so while I didn't know what I was going to make, I did decide to pull a stack of prints, a variety of prints. I had no idea what I was going to do with them. Ordered a bunch of pencils, um, got some of the Duramount for the first time, which I mentioned a few times during the, the studio uh, walkthrough, and packed up and left. And so while we were in Sweden, um, I did accomplish a, a small triptych. And in these pieces, you can see that um, I think some of the, the underlying styles and symbolism that shows up in the work that's on view now. Um, something that is always, I think, some of the ideas that are always present in my work and they take shape in different forms is our ideas of place, which I think you probably have already seen in the previous works, ideas of mortality, um, juxtapositions, whether that be through class structures or emotions or um, just kind of uh, the dynamics of life. But those are kind of always undercurrents, regardless of the type of work that I'm making that seem to surface. And in these pieces, um, I, was, I was not only trying to create work in kind of short fragmented periods of time, <laughs> for example, when my, my uh, 10 month old daughter was napping, um, but I was also, as I mentioned, trying to figure out who I was as an artist because I had had so many it was a bit of a roller coaster coming in and out of the studio with maternity leaves. Um, my husband and I are both full-time employees and so time was pretty precious. And during um, the childbirth and um, having toddlers, I just didn't have a lot of time. Um, one thing that, that did happen that is probably will make a lot of sense in my work moving forward is that we did lose um, our second child. So we did have, um, we had three children between 2010 and 2014, and we lost um, our son at birth. And so these pieces became important to me. Not only was I trying to kind of figure out who I was as a maker, but I was trying to, to grapple with a very intimate loss, something that transformed um, the way that, that we functioned as a family. But which had very little significance to anyone outside of our home because um, he didn't actually ever exist. And so what I was looking for was um, evidence, this idea of evidence and how, how do you stake claim to something that nobody necessarily recognizes that you've lost, right? So in any case, so um, these pieces became very important and for a number of reasons. Um, so not only was I, I working through a different type of loss that I had um, never experienced, but I was also starting to think about, well, what did it mean as, um, as I mentioned, you know, as a working parent and um, a unit with my husband, what does it mean by way of time? What does it mean by way of community? who am I now and um, what is my relationship to <laughs> these little people in the house? Um, so I, I, started a, I started working a little bit larger and I'm jumping ahead a couple of years, but there were other pieces and, but you see a lot of the same type of symbolism. So you see these kind of stereotypes of what is a, a rattle, what is a baby bed. I began exploring the relationship between um, tonal backgrounds and abstract backgrounds, and then also beginning to, to work in um, the idea of lines. And I, I liked lines, which later became ropes, as this way to, to talk about continuity, but also I think the symbolism goes beyond that as well. Um, so here, I mentioned the lithography earlier, and one of the reasons that I wanted to include the coal miners is not only because I've, I've recontextualized and repurposed some of them, but also at this point, I started using um, lithographs of ropes. And so I, I wanted to have this dark black rope that I could reuse and could appear in several pieces. And so 
I did that through a process of lithography. So printing on a stone and pulling just series and series and series of ropes and then cutting them and using them as needed. Um, during this time, I mentioned that I was, you know, beginning to work with that tonal background. I was working more abstractly. I began to think about, well, beyond the symbol, like if, if what these symbols are representing are people or types of people or an age group, such as children or myself or whomever, like what happens when I begin to bring a figure into the composition? And I also wanted to, quite honestly, um, create even more pieces. So that brings me to um, my artist residency in motherhood, which um, was funded um, through a sustainable arts, the Sustainable Arts Foundation um, by the, it, it was started by the artist um, Linka Clayton. And so during a, a one year period, I became, um, I, had, I had a proposal that I put forward determining the amount of time that I would devote to my work, the type of work I was looking to produce, and I, I set on that venture. And here you can see um, my youngest little studio helper, uh, Keegan, who was the, the screaming infant in the previous image. So during this time, my proposal was that I would um, take what I was doing, but I was going to push it even further. I was going to incorporate additional materials. So the, the media list became longer. And if you, you take a look at that, I, I started using everything from woodcut to silkscreen, lithographs, monoprints. I basically, nothing was off limits, so to speak, as far as the printing uh, process went. I also was very interested in using handmade paper. And then there's a lot of pen and ink that is still present. At this time, I began to kind of abandon what I what I considered in the the pieces like the rattle, et cetera, the baby bib, those pieces where I felt they were very kind of formally organized um, with a singular directional movement to playing more with this idea of density. Um, because I mentioned, you know, dualities previously. Um, I'm also interested in this idea of overlap and dense area of overlap and how that can be representational of, of um, the preoccupation of, of things that run through your head during the day, right? So whether or not we are parents or we have families, I do think that most people can identify with being so distracted or so busy that um, that becomes a metaphor for some of that layering. Um, where I had previously kind of in those other works been dealing with images that I was drawing and printing, right? Like here you see um, the little like children's saddle shoes. I decided that with the backgrounds, I would start working. I was already working with that mono print, the pressure print process. So rather than working just abstractly, like, well, rather non objectively, excuse me, I decided to work with things such as the excavator. And you can see the letters in the background. I decided to start picking up things in my house that my children were no longer using and making prints with those and using those as a background and a tone to work off to kind of further develop that story and talk about the duality of um, that, that most of us live within each and every day. Um, the pieces at times did become, I think, I always, I like to think, I play between um, a line of sometimes happiness and joy, and then at the same time, there are these underlying darker images as well. And it, it can sound a bit cliche, but I, I do firmly believe that those two things are so closely related that they're never exclusively, you know, experienced. Um, um, kind of like a positive for a negative, so to speak. And so that's, that's when those tones become even richer and darker. And I think that I became more aware of them in my work and tried to express them more fully as this body has continued. Um, the density and the collage, 
has also, I mentioned during the, the, the studio walkthrough that I am working intuitively. So what I mean by that is I am collecting material. I have that material spread out in my studio on the tabletops and desks. And while the images such as the coal miner or a rope may have had a very specific reason why I was personally interested in it, I'm not necessarily always relying on that original intent when I'm composing the image. Rather, I am looking to have those indicators and those symbols within the pieces, but oftentimes the assembly of the work becomes a reaction to my previous decision. And so when I lay down, for instance, I don't know, like a, a heavily decorative area, like what you see here with the, um, the gold and silver foil um, here, I may then decide that I need to add black in another area just to offset that. And so I'm always responding almost formally and visually just to, to what I have previously done. Um, also, as this work has progressed um, and my children have aged and become um, interested in working in the studio with me, I have begun um, collaborating with them in a more deliberate way. So rather than just having things such as you know, the excavator or the letter forms as a background, they are now contributing drawings that sometimes are, <laughs> um, that are so nice that I just have to ask them permission if I can have them and use them. And sometimes they produce things specifically because they think they belong in a picture frame. So here you have some drawings by my son and this is Indiana Jones and the Great Explorers. Um, I also, in, here, here's, here's Kelly, this is our son. Um, he's pointing to the Cyclops, which is his drawing. And then um, the cat is actually the drawing of my daughter's. But, but so those, those pieces, um, what I liked is that not only was there just this obvious marking of youth, a, a mark of a child, but then I believe by taking those out of the original forms of their drawings, which may have been a cyclops with a village of people, I have no idea because I don't remember, but I'm able to recontextualize and think about how the, the obvious mark of, of um, you know, our, our child in relationship to these weathering and aged hands that are, you know, holding on to a rope, but their fingers can't actually bend there becomes a real conversation not only between that duality of, of happiness and sadness or time, but it also just is another way for me to think about how all of these pieces fit together in my life as an artist. Um, at the same time, I've, I've been scaling up, and as I've been scaling up, um, I keep talking about this darkness in the drawings. And in this case, there is like a physical darkness, but also as I've been working, you'll notice that in certain pieces, I'm really pushing and, ex and experimenting in ways to make an atmospheric depth in the work. And so what I mean by that is a good example would be where this bird is a, a silhouette. And then we have kind of the darker value around it, which adds that depth of form. And then because there are so many tones of gray, you kind of see that interweaving not only of the collage and um, the ideas, but you also kind of see how there's no distinct fore, middle, and background, but there's more of like a woven pattern that talks about spatial um, depth in the work. Um, this is another one of the large pieces. As I've been moving through the work and thinking about how the pieces, while they are coming from a personal experience in my personal kind of day-to-day -day life, I also um, am aware that these ideas are often experienced by many people, right? And so I enjoy bringing some kind of popular icons, and in this case, Dolly Parton, uh, making you know reference to some of those things, because that also, to me, talks about culture and place. Um, and as another way of, of talking about this idea of communication and how we relate to those around us. Not only those that we have built a life with, but with people that we come in contact with each and every day. And um, so this piece, when I'm talking about kind of, you know, um, 
characters. <laughs> we have uh, Roscoe P. Coltrane, who is, um, for those of us who have ever seen <laughs> the TV show, um, was someone who was not very articulate <laughs> and um, could not um, really carry on at all without stuttering. And so thinking about this in relationship to not only the layering and the way that that can become a muddled form of communication, but you also have the bottles that are, you know, you throw a bottle, bottle uh, message in a bottle out into the water. So those would become different ways and different symbols in which that I do approach, um, you know, singular kind of ideas in the work. Um, and so the last couple of pieces that I have to show you um, are, are very much dealing with the similar ideas. Um, we do continue to see this kind of depth of space that I'm developing. Uh, with the graphite in the background and talking about this disjointed nature in which that sometimes we feel um, ourselves with others. And then also um, moving into this piece, I'm also working a lot now with um, animals and in this case birds. You, you probably noticed this particular bird and this is what I love about printmaking, right? So I was able to pull a number of images with this image over and over again and it take on just a different form in each of the pieces and then even when you put it in relationship and juxtapose it with the kind of chicken coming out of the hole it really does begin to to change the meaning but it, it definitely to me brings up ideas of taking flight and in this case with those birds coming out i was thinking about coming up for air um and that's something that I didn't mention, but hopefully you picked up on is sometimes the titles are kind of a, maybe serve as a metaphor for what I'm thinking about in the work, um, but also could add just a contrast maybe to, to what one would think on their first read of the piece. Um, so in any case, so some of those pieces were from the exhibit and, and some were just uh, from other pieces within the current body of work. I, I, I don't want to take up too much time. I had timed it and it was about 40 minutes and I had told myself I'd make it a little bit better and go a little bit shorter and I think that I did. Um, but if you're interested in seeing more of my work, you know, I encourage you um, not only to go to the exhibit, but you can check out my website or Instagram. Um, and that, that really is about it for me.